Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce to you uh, a longtime friend of mine and a boss of mine for many years. Um, and I'd say that uh, I'm impressed by him for many reasons, not just because he's one of the most 100 influential Hispanic leaders in the United States, not because he published one of the leading textbooks in the United States, uh, not just because he is invited to the White House to t discuss higher ed policy, uh, not just because he was the Secretary of Higher Education in New Mexico, and not just because he's president of one of the largest universities in the state of Texas, but because of the kind of person he is. He has experience in social work that's very deep. The first time I met him, I, he had just come to New Mexico State, and I ran back and looked at his beat. I said, how did I miss that he was a social worker? And uh, I realized he wasn't by uh, degree, but he certainly is by his knowledge and experience. And he's also extremely knowledgeable about Title IV-E, and uh, has shown that through the years over and over again. But he's also a, a really true human being that I've seen uh, deal with people at the White House and then also invite homeless people in off the street, find dinner, we sit down and visit. One young man couldn't believe that he was talking to the president of the University of Houston downtown. So the president gave him his cell phone and let him call his mother and tell him. So that's the kind of person we are so fortunate to have as the president of the university of Houston downtown, uh, William Flores, and he will be uh, welcoming you all to Galveston. Dr. Flores. You know, I, I've known Alvin for quite a while, and uh, in, in New Mexico, um, there's a lot of jokes about Texans. <laughs> in fact, one of the things that they say um, in, in Spanish, Pobre México tan lejos de Dios y tan cerca a Texas. Which means, for those of you who don't speak Spanish, poor New Mexico, so far away from God and so close to Texas. <laughs> the other thing that they say about Texas is that um, they, they have these horns, and like Pinocchio's nose, as they exaggerate, the horns get bigger and bigger. <laughs> there were some big horns on this uh, stage. But, you know, um, it's, it's, you know uh, it's, it's always good to have someone who uh, is, that you enjoy working with as a colleague and as a friend. Um, even if he's, there was slight exaggeration there in, in uh, my resume. But, but uh, I appreciate so much what, what uh, over the years, that Elvin has done, not just, in, uh, we worked together in New Mexico State, uh, we worked, I was, when I was provost there, and he was department chair. And then later on, uh, when we needed to set up a center in Albuquerque, uh, he and his wife, uh, because of family, moved to Albuquerque and set up the center to, to expand the MSW program, and had a wonderfully successful program. Then later, in the state of, Tech, of New Mexico, set up the Center for Behavioral Health Training, Evaluation, and Research, CIBA. And Alvin was on the board, and I was uh, the um, co-chair of that statewide consortium. Uh, worked together on a collaborative um, and several other initiatives. But I must say that, that I've always been impressed by uh, that not just Elvin, but the people that I've met through Elvin, people that are involved in social work on the national level, <coughs> and people that, you know, this, this conference is 17 years old. We started in uh, the Texas State, San Marcos, I think when Elvin was there, it's been a place since Elvin, <laughs> has started so many things, uh, including 4E. He was involved in some of the early legislation to get that passed. What a, an amazing uh, scenario. If you think of the kind of collaboration between the federal government, 
state governments and state and local agencies and universities <laughs> for the training of social workers and for the partnerships that can successfully sustain, sustain and solve problems. You know, when, when I was uh, at uh, Cal State Northridge, one of the, the things they asked me to do, and I did some consulting work with the County of Los Angeles because, and I was not the only one part of the group that were uh, brought in to help consult as they were going through some transformation in the social work department, in the county social services for Los Angeles County, as they were moving from essentially looking at social work as eligibility work and as certification to more problem solving and case management. And on the state level, in the state of California, as they were looking at how do you take, when there's multiple occurrences, and the same client is in various agencies at different, at different uh, processes, perhaps in occupational therapy, perhaps in mental health, perhaps in family services, perhaps in court. How do you track all those things and bring that together and develop strategies um, that are in common with a common clock so that one is just ticking uh, and, and benefits end and another starts and without, without comprehensive care? I think one of the great things about conferences like this is that they allow us to talk, to share experiences, to understand what are some of the best practices that we see, and research-based, evidence-based practices that we can apply, that we can, that we can uh, either in the agencies or with our students, bring in and bring to life. And I, I can tell you that every time I come to one of these conferences, I learn. I learn from at the presentations, but also uh, over drinks or dinner as we share some experiences. And, and I'm particularly happy at this particular presentation because we're going to uh, hear from some people that I actually had a chance to visit with in San Diego and see their work concretely. And I'm tremendously impressed with what they do and the, not only the challenges they face, but how they brought together multifaceted solutions to some problems that, that, in many respects, every county and every city faces, and that not every university handles as, as well for us. Um, UHD, as you know, uh, we have a social work program. We don't have a master's degree. We're very uh, proud to be a partner with the University of Houston, and there's some faculty here from the University of Houston's program and master's MSW and the PhD program. Our students are going from that program uh, are going from uh, uh, the, the bachelor's of social work into UH and other places. And I hope to grow and, and see over time a very large and successful social work program because Houston needs it, <coughs> Texas needs it. And when we look at the change in demography of social work, uh, we all need it. We have to be, we're going to need to produce more social workers we may not have the federal funds um, to, you know, it's unclear, and I know there's a workshop later on in terms of the, of the changes that are going to be taking place in Title IV-E. We hope that that will continue under, under the federal legislation. But there certainly is going to need to be social work and social work practice and programs that, that are vitalized by agencies and, and the sharing of practice like this conference. So I salute all of you and uh, Elvin particularly for uh, having the foresight to bring social workers to such a great place. Uh, you know, where you get to, to swim up to the bar. <laughs> and which has got to be ther therapy. <laughs> and even on the floor, I, I don't know if you saw me or right in a, uh, a, uh, an ice cream, they have a ice cream dispensing machine is free downstairs in the, uh, after your workshops. And, uh, and, you know, there's chocolates, fudges, and I was good, I just got fruit. <laughs> but that's because my wife is here. Uh, in, in, uh, I'd like to introduce, actually, Dr. Noel Bazette Flores. Um, we met uh, a couple years ago 
when I first came to uh, to Houston, and uh, she was at Lone Star in, uh, in the college district, working in Kingwood in building partnerships, building a partnership actually with the University of Houston for transfers and for uh, making sure that students could actually continue their education at the two plus two program at um, the University of uh, at Lone Star uh, College, but getting the UHG degree. One of our faculty from the University of Houston downtown worked with her, and together they put together a partnership that won the state award for the best partnership in higher education and the most successful, called the Star Award. Shortly after that, she got recognized for the, the work that she did in service learning. <coughs> and her team won a state and national award. Uh, Noelle is, uh, this is the fifth year that she has served as chair of uh, Citizenship Week, which has now become Citizenship Month. Houston is one of the few institutions in the country that puts on a conference uh, not a conference, a whole series of activities. And Noel started off under Mayor White, now under Anise Parker. It has grow, grown from one event and really a small event that was done to, to bring the refugee community together and to celebrate citizenship to over 200 organizations in Houston participating and holding events and now it is a month-long celebration of citizenship uh, and, and encouraging people to give back, of students to participate, of faculty and staff to, and to integrate into their classes, uh, civic participation. So she also has, is now the director of a, a center that, that Elvin created, uh, which will, as Elvin transitions out, she will be coming in as the Director of the Center is now called what, Noel? For Public Service and Family Strengths. The Center for Public Service and Family Strengths. So, uh, without further ado, I'll let Noel introduce our speakers and thank you so much and welcome to this wonderful conference. No, I'm, kidding. <laughs> um, I'm here to celebrate the work of uh, Carla and Ken, and um, it's my pleasure to introduce Ken Nakamura and Carla Morales today. I met them both last year, as Dr. Flores mentioned, at the symposium. I was instantly connected to their work, and I'll have to explain why. My, my doctoral work doesn't exactly explain my work and interest in social work either because I have a PhD in ed psych, but um, migrated over to the College of Social Work at UH Maine to get all my qualitative studies done because I ended up working with individual differences in immigrant refugee populations and systems theories and the families and how they function within all the systems in the city in the process of resettlement. So I, I did um, similarly to my husband, become a social worker by default. So um, I was drawn to the work because it was so similarly aligned to what I've been doing. Um, and Ken brought a competent and confident group of Title 40 students to share results from their effort in San Diego County. Um, we were very interested in it. I've been born, I was born and raised in San Diego, as was Dr. Flores. And several aspects of their work excited my sense of social advocacy and community outreach. Their effort was initially well-rooted in an elementary school site in East San Diego and branched out to the surrounding communities. It focused on issues such as political, cultural, social, and economic systems that affect child welfare. Many children in that community were Hispanic immigrant populations, Arabic, uh, refugees of, of Arabic descent, some Caucasian. Um, Mr. Nakamura's students' experience felt um, in many ways symbiotic to my own as a doctoral student that was also rooted initially in a, an elementary school that had a high influx of refugee children and Hispanic immigrant children. 
I too had come to the realization similarly to Ken that, um, that this was not a situational issue that could be addressed. That these children were part of a familial system, they were part of all these other layers, and they lived in a neighborhood and a community. Those interactions were inexorably tied. The well-being of the family or the child will either increase or decrease depending on how stable the, that community was for them and the resources that they have access to. Ken and I connected last year, so much so that we flew out to look at his project in East San Diego County and visited the Bella Vista apartment complex. That's how I pronounced that correctly. Okay. Um, the student work continues there. They are dedicated, those students, Carla being one of them that worked on that project, and, and they've worked tirelessly with the goal of strengthening community and increasing the well-being of the families that reside within. Ken and his students introduced me to the community, to the neighborhood, to the apartment manager that was the gatekeeper for them in that community. Um, I also was able to uh, meet the, uh, in, arranged by their program, the HHSA East County Regional Manager for Social Services, uh, Child Sur Welfare Services, and I learned much about their project during that trip. Ken students are also employed social workers. They are also students in internships. Under Mr. Nakamura's tutelage, they have learned that best practice includes a holistic, ecological approach to family and community well-being. Ken arrived at San Diego State in 2010 and wrote in the social work newsletter, which I dug up. <laughs> that year he wrote, leadership development and succession planning could be aspects of a more organized learning experience in field internships for student employees. One way to do this is to build multi-year plans to increase their range and depth of preparation. He successfully done so with his projects. Ken's approach is successful, strengths-based, and holistic. One of Ken's star students, Carl Morales, will be presenting with him shortly, is a county social worker who has now completed a multi-year MSW program. She has dedicated and talked with me openly last year in San Diego about the pros and cons of being an employee and a student working in a single community. For example, how do you develop trust in a community where you might also be the same person who shows up at the door having to do a removal from a home? That might be the best interest of the child that day. Carla Morales helped build rapport, though, in that community, where she was able to enhance her relationships with other community organizations and the members that reside within that neighborhood. The goal, of course, improving and strengthening the community through outreach and awareness, with the hopeful end result of decreased referrals. This method blends a mix of prevention and intervention all the while never alienating the families that reside in that neighborhood. The approach in many ways student-driven, creating student leaders. Carla is an outstanding student and employee. Ken has cultivated a rich environment that nurtures the growth of bright and creative social workers and forward-thinking students. I applaud you both for being leaders in the development of a new era of strength-based holistic perspectives in social work. Welcome. Well, Bill, thank you very much for inviting us here. And uh, it was very sweet when you came out to San Diego and took the time to visit uh, all of the employees at San Diego County Child Welfare Services in the East Region. We're very appreciative just to take that extra time to go out and look at the apartment complex to see the work that they've done. Um, I also want to thank Alvin, of course, and the Center for Family Strengths here at the University of Houston downtown. It's both an honor and a privilege, obviously, to have this moment to share a little bit about the work we do. And at the same time, I hope you will realize that Texans do seem to tell a big story. Uh, 
I like to think the work that I'm doing is very small, and I prefer it that way, because um, the magic of uh, what I believe in, in our profession, in our work, is really less about us and more about the people who live in communities. And our power to bring the strengths of their capacity and the challenges that they face, and to make it public and real, and no longer allow certain kinds of voices to be silenced, is critical in our work. In child welfare, most of all, I think it's essential that both the workers and the families that are served have the opportunity to create different kinds of dialogue and different kinds of experiences that bring health and well-being for families and for communities. I'm going to ask uh, a little of your patience, I hope. Um, I realize that a lot of us in the field, both in practice as well as uh, at the universities, often use the same words but I'm not so sure that we always mean the same things. And um, I wouldn't be a social worker, and I haven't. Well, I graduated from Berkeley in 83, so we're talking, in my life, 30 years of professional social work. But I really started with children when I was 17, and uh, if I really look at the influences in my life, I have to take you back to a much earlier time in my life, that continues to guide the work that I do. And so if you'll bear with me, I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself so you understand what drives my motivation and interest, particularly in social justice, and particularly working with diverse communities. Um, you know, I'm third generation Japanese American. Now, my parents are a very unique generation in the sense that both of my parents were born in the United States of of immigrant parents, but as infants were, went back to Japan for various reasons and grew up in Japan and were educated in Japan. My father came back to the United States, uh, labored in the farms and, and the fields as a 19-year-old um, before World War II. And my mother actually came in her 20s later after World War II as a picture bride for my father. I told this to a Yurok woman who was my administrative assistant at Humboldt State at one time, and she said, you know, we need to get back to that, because uh, the funny thing is that sometimes arranged marriages actually work better than the ones we seek by love and affection. Um, but seriously, um, why that influenced me so much, as you can imagine, is when I was growing up in the 50s, uh, I actually lived at the same address from the age of one until I was 18 and graduated from high school and left for Berkeley. I grew up in Anaheim, California. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that part of uh, Orange County. Um, but back in the 50s, it was a predominantly white community. And uh, there were very few Japanese that actually lived in Anaheim at the time. Uh, I like to say that uh, what makes me uh, what, what's influenced me a great deal is I actually grew up with Disneyland. Um, I was born in 53, Disneyland opened in 55, and Disneyland was forever connected in my life until I left Anaheim at 18. Um, and, you know, if you think about the old Disneyland, it had uh, Adventureland, Frontierland, Tomorrowland, Main Street. Uh, being one of the few Japanese in Southern California in Anaheim, not, not Southern California as a whole, but in Anaheim, at that time, I kind of felt like I grew up in Frontierland. And that um, life was always in something new. But I was very clear that what went on inside my home was very different than what went on in the homes of my friends and my classmates that I met in school. Uh, everything from food to uh, faith and religion to uh, the ways uh, parents and children interacted and uh, being somewhat different, um, it has always driven me to not remain in the center, but prefer to be on the borders and on the edges of things. And I say that because um, one of the things that I realized is that my parents' lives were uh, lives of hardship, much like many immigrants today and uh, refugees today uh, that I've worked with for over the last 30 years. But my parents, uh, being Japanese, 
and um, and I say I'm lucky. I repeat this everywhere I go to students when I talk about my family life. I say I'm lucky because both of my parents were incredibly loving and patient and uh, very encouraging in a world that had been actually very cruel and harsh and difficult for them. And one of the things I learned from their lives and my experience with them, uh, they both died. My mother died at 54. My father died at 69. Um, what I learned is something that uh, I couldn't define when I became a young adult, but I recognized was one of the questions that I needed to answer. How is it possible that someone can experience such prejudice and hate to be denied the opportunities to be the fullest human being they can be? How is it possible for someone to experience the suffering of loss, and dislocation, and be treated as an outcast, and still raise their children with love and grace and encouragement for the future? And I would tell you that my work's experience has been committed with the belief that it's possible to create that experience for every child and every family, regardless of their circumstances. And I was lucky enough when I grew up um, to eventually go to Berkeley as a university. My parents, of course, had not gone to school here in the United States. Uh, being a first-generation college student, it was something that I assumed I would be. I happened to grow up at a time, if, if those of you that have gray hair and look to be about the same age as I am, you might have experienced the same things. Uh, when I was in elementary school, John F. Kennedy was president, and there was this drive for a notion of the best and brightest. Now, at the time, it was very rewarding for me because I was allowed or uh, had the opportunities to participate in an enormous amount enrichment programs because we were going to be this generation of the best and brightest. Now what I learned in the process of growing up is that as much as that I was privileged in many ways to have those opportunities, I had friends and fellow classmates who were denied the same opportunities and the same possibility. It had very little to do with their capacity or their capability but due to scores on IQ tests and whatever measures they used, only some of us were provided with that enrichment. But being young at the time and growing up with that, I always thought it was about me. It's, it's, a, it's a great American tradition, it's about me, which is very different than the tradition of my parents, in which it's about family, and it's about your ancestors, and it's not only about yourself, but the fact that you're interconnected to the well-being of others all around you, some who are next to you and some who you never see. But that notion of interconnectedness is what allowed them to stay graceful in times of enormous turmoil and pain. And that sense of interconnectedness is what gave faith for them to believe that my future is inextricably tied to not only the way they conduct themselves in their lives, but the way that I'll conduct myself in relationship to other people. And with that guiding, I went to Berkeley, um, eventually got my master's degree in social work. I'm one of those uh, college students who took their time. And uh, I think it benefited me because I spent close to 10 years working for the university's child care program at a time when child care wasn't a service that was guaranteed by going to school at the university. It was actually a hard-fought, hard-earned, ultimate end by predominantly women, young women with children who chose to believe that a public university should provide care for their children while they pursued their education. And that effort 
taught me a lot at an age of 19 and 20 when I first started working there, which is that I met women who were at the ages of 23, 24, 26, who had the foresight and insight to see where the funding was possible, to organize the university to receive associated student funding and match it with three to one matching dollars from the feds, and take a small program that served about 10 children an hour to one that ultimately was serving about 130 children and then about 300 families total within about a year's time. It was also a place in which men and women questioned their roles and spent time actually as a staff examining attitudes about gender and about relationships and about the place of children's abilities to grow and foster the healthiest possibilities. And so we had a very dynamic place, um, some fascinating political struggles and conversations, but I smile at to think that I was 19 and 20 and actually thought I knew what I was saying at the time. But it was a wonderful, enriching experience. It was also a place where, uh, and I thank her enormously, it was a woman named Sue Brock. Um, at about 25 and 26, she was heading this child care program, and she spent a good portion of her time commuting from Berkeley to Sacramento to work with legislators in producing legislation that was specific to providing funding for campus child care centers in California. And I, in my very naive stance at 20, happened to say to her one day, what do you do when you go to Sacramento? And her attitude was, well, come with me. And she put me in positions in legislative offices in which I had not a clue what they were talking. I understood the legislative process, but I had no idea what all the discussions were about, square footage, da, 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 all these details. But she always found a wonderful place to insert me into the conversation by saying to them that they should ask me, since I work with parents and children, that I have some knowledge about the experiences that student parents go through and what it means to their children. And I could always answer that because I spent all my days spending time with children and their parents, dealing with separations and the joys and happiness of their growth. Again, very small, but it's important for me to share it because the irony is uh, in 2008 I retired as the chair and the director of the graduate program at Humboldt State University's Department of Social Work, where we started a, a program for a primary focus on working with rural and Native American communities, which is, still remains somewhat unusual in the, state, in the United States as a whole. There are very few programs with an emphasis in working with American Indians. But I love to tell people that I was a child care worker because it is equally as important as the work that I did later as a director and a chair of a graduate social work program. And I have never forgotten that. The other part I want to talk about a little bit is my experiences in rural Humboldt County before I, I uh, retired and moved to San Diego. Humboldt County was a different world for me. But oddly enough, it reminded me of my childhood, having grown up in a predominantly white community and being one of the few Japanese growing up there at the time. When I went to Humboldt County, Humboldt County at the time was about 80-85% white, 15% uh, ethnic minorities. Um, about 10% of that were actually uh, indigenous communities, Native Americans who lived there. Um, There's a number of tribes and one of the largest, or the largest in California, the Yurok tribe, is located up there. Um, but over the 20 years that I was at Humboldt, the population has been gradually shifting and growing with um, more families of color moving into the area. And the population is probably closer, somewhere around 20% of families of color. One of the earliest groups I worked with, the community group that I worked with, was the Hmong. For those of you who are familiar, Southeast Asian refugee communities that were um, in some part located into Humboldt County of all places, um, where there's very high unemployment at the time, and um, a community that was unfamiliar, let us say, with Southeast Asians. Um, 
And the power and struggle of that community was that um, for elders in that community to be able to maintain the leadership role that they had, the responsibility. Uh, I want to be clear, because um, sometimes when I say these things, I'm not sure what you're hearing from me, but when I say uh, their leadership role, I don't mean the sense of entitled power and authority. I mean the sense of responsibility and obligation they have to care for the welfare of, of their families that they're responsible for. And so these clan leaders would suffer because it was a very small community and with no work and no viable way to sustain and to be dependent on public assistance and to live actually in housing that uh, was not the way that they would have liked to associate with one another. And in that mix, one of the things we realized that we could do is to develop programs in which the elders could continue to teach the Hmong language to their young, and to also outsiders, as well as bring young people to the position of being able to uh, learn English more fluently while maintaining their culture and their language. And I mention this because when we get to the issues specific to child welfare services, I know that I do not need to tell this audience that no matter what innovations child welfare has engendered, no matter what kinds of funding we have spent, that the disparate and disproportional outcomes for particular groups of color continue to persist at the same proportions and at the same degrees of disparities. And so it's important to think in different ways in which communities master, struggle, survive, honor, and care for the young. Because it's in those different practices and those different approaches that if we would incorporate in the ways we do child welfare services in California, in the United States as a whole, we would have much stronger relationships and much greater possibility for health and well-being. In Humboldt County, one of the things I learned as also a board member of a community foundation was that rather than the typical process of providing grants and funding, uh, seeking requests for funding and providing grants, one of the other ways to do it would be to actually listen to people in the community and find out the places where people were doing innovative work or work with commitment and dedication to the residents in their communities, and to approach them and ask them, what is it that they need to continue that effort? And what is it that they aspire for in that effort? And with very small sums of money, you're able to engender enormous change because you're actually approaching the people who are most committed and most motivated for it. The other part I learned though very quickly is that in my work with tribal communities in Humboldt County, one of the things that's hardest for most of us who are outsiders, and especially with professional degrees and belief in ourselves that we have some skill or some specialized knowledge or ability to work, is that we often enter into communities and want to sort of tell them how better to do things. We also sometimes include people of color, and particularly tribal community members, to participate in processes that are structured in ways that make sense to the mainstream of our cultures and societies, but in a way that doesn't reach the people, nor actually include them. And more importantly, the aspect that we fail to do, I think, at times, is trust and believe that decision-making relies best in the community than it does in the agency. So uh, I say all that because at San Diego State, I've had this great opportunity to be part of a larger consortium. California, for the past 20 years, with the California Social Work Education Center, uh, has had a wonderful consortium of now 21 schools of social work uh, in coordination and, and collaboration with the 58 counties of California. Um, 20 years ago, there were only 10 schools of social work. There are now 21, and I think 22 or 23 will be on their way. Um, 
but a large measure of that growth of those university schools of social work programs has been the impact of CalSWEC and Title IV e funding. And it's important to remember that um, because it's been a, a major influence in the state of California. And San Diego State is one of those original 10 schools and, and currently one of the 21 schools. So I have wonderful colleagues throughout the state doing some amazing work. And this opportunity to share a little bit about what we do and what we're doing in San Diego, I want you to keep it in that perspective, that these are efforts. And I have a certain belief about the need to move the center of preparation. Uh, I love the theme of this year's conference, because what is that kind of professional preparation we need in order to move the quality of child welfare? forward in the next millennium. I think it's important to begin to think about some things that go back to the roots of social work and that define us and then provide us guidance in times of differences and the challenges we face. Uh, social justice to me is not just a large notion. Uh, I hope in the presentation from Carla as she talks about the work that they're doing, that you'll hear underneath it the, the motivation and the reasons for creating that kind of opportunity and part of our work, and to work together from a university and a county child welfare system to look at different ways to improve the quality of life for residents. But the focus for me falls in two areas in order to address social justice and social workers and child welfare. One is that you have to move outside of the agency that preparation of social workers focus solely on meeting the needs of the agency, defining a focus on skill building and practice solely from the eyes and lens of the agency is problematic. Because if we're not careful in what our history tells us, is when we do that, the workers within agencies get driven by agency policy and get, quite frankly, get driven by the realities of funding, time, staffing at the expense of families in our communities, no matter how hard they try, and no matter how hard we organize. If you focus only on developing an agency consciousness and an agency set of skills, it will continue to fail to meet the needs of our diverse communities. And once you move out of that center of the agency, and you begin to move workers and students in preparation for work out into the communities, and they have to straddle the conflicting realities of agency practice and community life, that is at the point in which creativity and innovation and hope resides. And it is incumbent on us as social work educators to push and to define that borderline between communities and agency life to look different than it does today. Otherwise, no matter what the innovation or effort or funding or motivation, no matter if we go another 100 years at the Children's Bureau, no matter what, we will be looking at the same kinds of outcomes for particularly people of color, and we will continue to see what's happening in this country as a growing group and larger group of people who live in poverty, and if we don't address those realities, and unless we partner with those communities in such a way that they have greater voice and greater determination in the ways to create safety and well-being, then we will continue to create a way to deny those communities the free opportunity. Let me give you just a very quick example. Um, Something that we don't even talk about as social workers very much, and something that actually isn't related in people's minds to child welfare, but it's at the heart and center of it. You know, about 20 years ago, there was a hard push in the United States to really look at the impact of lead poisoning in our communities. And there was a, a greater effort in the CDC to put money into lead abatement programs, education about the impact of lead poisoning, right? And over the last 20 years, um, there's been some wonderful outcomes. There's been a reduction in many ways. 
but it would probably surprise most people that CDC had set the standard at 10 micrograms per deciliter of lead as a safe level. But over these past 20 years, almost every study shows that it takes even a smaller quantity before it has serious impact on the development, particularly of children from the ages of one to five, that any level of lead, but particularly above five, already makes long-term effects in their, service, uh, in their central nervous system to the point that attention span, cognitive ability, all of those things are impacted. We know this to be true. Studies after studies. Most people see a picture of lead poisoning as somebody who's been so impacted by the ingestion of lead that they're actually going to die from the coma. And there have been deaths, obviously, and children have died. That motivation over the last 20 years to try to address it, for those of you who are not aware, in 2012, our US Congress took a very small money that had been allocated, 29 million, to continue to improve this effort of education and change around understanding the impact of lead, lead poisoning, and cut it down to two million for the United States, which is just about uh, ensured that almost every state no longer is able to monitor or provide the education, let alone the testing needed to protect our young children. It's estimated that there are three million children in the United States who live in housing that continues to be a source of lead. With all the progress, guess who's most impacted and has the greatest risk of lead poisoning? The younger you are, so children from the age of one to five, I don't know how many of you are familiar what a microgram looks like. If you take a, a packet of sugar, you know the little packets of sugar? If you think about that, that's about a gram of sugar. A microgram is one millionth of that package. So if you probably take a couple of granules of sugar, you're already at about five micrograms of lead. And it only takes somewhere in the neighborhood of about six months to a year, at most, for a child who's in contact with lead or has the potential of breathing lead dust. If they live in that persistent condition in housing, they're already at about five or six micrograms of lead. And as I said, the power of that is that we know who they are in most communities. We know where the saturation of lead from uh, leaded gasoline many years ago before it became unleaded has contaminated that soil. We know the housing that's been built prior to 1950 that was painted with lead paint and that continues to exist. It doesn't matter if you paint over it, do anything. When that begins to break down and turns to dust, the way children ingest it is they crawl along floors, they get things on their hands, they lick their fingers, they put their fingers in their mouth, and that little level of dust is already beginning to cause the impact that lead has on their system. Again, guess who is most impacted? The poorest in our communities, because they tend to live in substandard housing, they tend to live in places where housing is older and poorer in condition, and guess who, in terms of ethnicity and race, are most impacted by substandard housing, by levels of poverty, by neighborhoods in which land is contaminated. And when you understand the impact that it has on a child from, but with a very small amount, one thing that we know about lead is that we can't predict whether a little bit of lead will have a longer lasting effect because what we recognize is human beings are different and different children respond differently to the quantities of lead. 
so that even amounts that are considered somewhat safe can have the same negative effect on that child as a child who's had a larger and prolonged impact. Now, I ask you about the nature of child abuse in this country. We will invest thousands of dollars. We will require an individual parent who is in poverty and who is viewed as having not cared for or neglected the welfare of their child. But we will ignore the fact that they live in a housing in which lead is causing greater harm, not only to them, and to thousands of our young children at the same time. And I would suggest, depending on your perspective, that that level of neglect and abuse by society is far greater than the neglect and abuse of a poor single mother raising a child in a very difficult environment. And yet the painted picture of who is an unfit parent is quite different if you look at it from the view and the questioning of what is our social commitment. It cannot be simply to continue to create services in which we hire master level social workers to go into individual homes and to tell or support people hopefully to change and improve their lives. Child welfare services in America, in California, and in every state must have a mission and a commitment to partner with residents and communities to improve the welfare and conditions of the environment that our children depend on for their health, their education, and their well-being. We talk about trauma-informed practices, we talk about all kinds of things that are, please hear this, that are better than what we have been doing in the past. But unless we invest in the kinds of traumas that are created quietly and silently in our society and our culture, we will fail our younger generation and we will fail to create a society in which there's an equal opportunity and an equal right for any child, regardless of color, regardless of social status, come into this country. We can't pride ourselves in improving the practice of an individual worker or the approach that we support an individual parent. We need to pride ourselves as a profession, an educated profession, that we know on everyday level that we've allowed social conditions and economic conditions that make it impossible, literally impossible, for some children and some family to have the same opportunity that we say should be possible in this country. All of my work with the students that I currently work with, I wish I could say that we're all doing amazing, innovative, dynamic experiences, but we're not. I make sure that all of my students are prepared to work in child welfare services. We meet all kinds of requirements. We try to be as uh, collaborative and as hopeful as possible in preparing our workers to know how to handle everything from the beginning process to the end process. We do that. But what I've tried to do in places where I have opportunities is to encourage a different kind of relationship and a different approach to looking at some of our situations. Uh, Noel was naming some of them. We're working in a national city in an old part of town, um, probably about 99% Mexican and Mexican-American. A large portion of families there are, are undocumented. And, uh, but we have a number of partners from uh, the city council to public health to small organizations, the Environmental Health Coalition, a number to try to improve the quality of life in the neighborhood. It's a neighborhood, old neighborhood that has allowed businesses to come in and are doing things like painting cars and creating toxic quality in terms of air and land. Um, big trucks rumble down neighborhood streets and hit kids on bicycles. Um, so all of those things we're looking at at the same time as we're serving and working directly with families. In today's presentation, 
Tomorrow uh, in the workshop, I'll have some opportunities to talk about different ways we're looking at well-being as child welfare. But in today's presentation, I want to make sure that uh, in setting a little stage, Carla Morales, uh, she's now uh, an 11-year employee of San Diego County Child Welfare Services. And uh, four years ago, uh, she entered into our uh, part-time MSW program at San Diego State. And at the same time, she had two colleagues in the same office, uh, East Region and Child Welfare Services, who were also in the program. And so we had an opportunity to create a different kind of internship for them. I'll let Carla explain how and why. Um, I do want you to know that we've just completed the third year of this project, so it's not just a one-year, one-time internship opportunity, but it is now uh, the way East Region Child Welfare Services in San Diego County provides a portion of their child welfare work. And so it's an internship that within three years is now integrated into the way the agency works. And I want to point this out because uh, I'm a firm believer of this from my work in a very poor rural community. Never be driven by money. If you create and work solely by the drive to have the funding and to utilize the funding, it squanders sometimes the primary purpose of your work to be driven by other. So this is an effort that took no other dollars. Well, it takes some time from people. But what I really want to point out is that it is, I hope, an example of the best ways to utilize the intelligence and the talents and the commitments of students through an internship process that has now been driven in different ways by interns over the past three years to move from something that didn't exist to now being something that's a part of the culture of that particular region of child welfare services. That is my goal. It is not that we have San Diego State University involved. What I want to have my students do, particularly employee students, is to construct ways of learning and doing that become integrated into the way practice is done in this county. Uh, I'll leave the rest of the time for Carla because, um, and I again thank you for your patience and for what I've said. Um, I think you'll find the concepts, the ideas, the intentions are generated not in only as conceptual ideas, but my interest is to ground them. And then one last thing I want to say, because we're into such an evidence-based world. I want my students to be the creators and the innovators of what's possible. But in order to do that, you have to be willing to risk and to try and to do things in scale. But you have to be willing to take what you imagine and begin to put it into action. What I love about Carla and Summer and Sarah who can't be here, the three of them evolved to an idea and then they put it into action. I'm not interested in the traditional practices of evaluation for one reason. In my work with communities of color, particularly tribal communities, they greatly resent the history of their experiences with public entities, with contractors, with evaluators, researchers. Because they feel they've been the objects, that they've been utilized for knowledge that goes away from their communities, and then three or five years later is pronounced as some importance, and all that while they've suffered the consequences of their conditions, the sharing of that information has never come back to immediately benefit them. I don't know who out in this audience, but I trust that there are some here who are engaged in other kinds of practices. I'm always very interested in feminist participatory action practices, because they make sense to me as a way to work closely with communities and to develop the talents and skills of members in the community to define the direction and the meaning of the evaluation, the research, that they construct the agendas. 
and they develop the skills to pursue the recognition of what they are learning and finding, and then immediately being able to translate that into action and activities within their own communities to improve the quality of life. That's the model I want to get to. In order to do that, what you have to do is build a base and a foundation. So I'm always interested that my work is not in and of itself important. The projects by themselves are only different ways to expand the space and the room to be more creative in the future. And so I hope when you're listening to Carla, you're thinking not only that this is an apartment complex in a particular city, nor am I suggesting that you should generalize and try to do the same thing. But the ideas embedded in it is a faith and trust in people, and that, that I encourage people to find dialogue with their communities and to extend not only the ideas of participation to community, but extend the notion that decision making and planning can actually be done by communities. So uh, let me introduce Carla Morales, San Diego State MSW student, Title IV-E, and also an 11 year child welfare worker at San Diego County. Hello everyone, thank you. Um, Dr. Flores and Dr. Flores for this opportunity. Um, like Ken said, my name is Carla Morales and I have been an employee with San Diego Child Welfare Services for the last 11 years. I am also in my last year of the Title IV-E MSW program. So I'm quite excited about that one more year to go. Um, but before I get into the details of the internship project that I had the opportunity to be a part of, I would like to give everyone a little bit of background on San Diego County Child Welfare Services. So bear with me, I'm learning how to use this clicker. Let's see, okay. Um, the community landscape. San Diego County is comprised of six different regions, ranging from North Coastal, North Inland, North Central, Central, South, and East. Um, presently, I am working in East Region, and as you can see, that East Region is the second largest region in San Diego County. Um, San Diego County Child Welfare Services comprise, like I said, of six uh, different regions. And on average, San Diego Child Welfare Services receives 39,000 um, calls for child abuse and neglect through the Child Abuse Hotline. Of that, um, it represents 71,000 children. Of those calls, 22,821 were assigned for investigation. 3,000 of those children um, had open voluntary cases and 2,000 petitions were filed on those children um, that were filed in the juvenile court. So that's a little bit of background on San Diego County. I, like I said, work in East Region and that is based on Neighborhoods for Kids East Region. And the model is whatever it takes until it takes one child at a time. N4K's mi mission is to keep children in their familiar environment. The main goal is to collaborate with child welfare services, schools, law enforcement and communities to ensure that we can make sure that if children have to come to the attention of our agency and cannot remain in the home of their parents, that they can remain in their familiar environments. Um, by doing this, East Region is able to produce short-term outcomes and lifelong benefits um, for abused children. Neighborhoods for Kids keeps abused children in their familiar environments with people they know and trust. Um, this helps to reduce trauma it also helps to maintain academic progress and to improve life outcomes. Um, by implementing this view and this innovative um, outlook on child welfare services, it keeps the focus on making sure that we are ensuring that the children are in the best possible placement and feeling safe in their environments. East region is comprised of five different clusters, and the cluster model consists or is based on the school demographics. So the different school, um, what are they called? different districts. There, thank you, Ken. The different school districts. Um, the five different clusters are the La Mesa cluster, the Al Cajon cluster, the Spring Valley cluster, and Spring Valley Lemon Grove cluster, and the rural cluster. The largest and darkest brown um, spot there, and that, that is rural. And the reason it's larger is mainly because it goes all the way up until um, they got there, which is right before Mexico. 
Um, within these clusters, the social workers are divided within these clusters and we basically do all services within each cluster. We handle emergency response, also continuing services which includes family reunification and case management and voluntary services. Okay. In East Region, um, we average about 321 referrals per month um, with an estimated removal of 30 children. Some of the statistics that we are very proud of is that we have 72.1% um, of the children that are removed in relative placements. 94.1% um, is placement stability, which basically means that these children have had fewer than three um, changes of placement. Uh, we also have 70.3% of these children in their same school of enrollment, so their same um, school of origin. And we have 100% of our high school students who complete and graduate from high school and receive their diploma. <laughs> One of the largest clusters in East Region is the Alcohol Cluster, where I currently work. Um, Alcohol. The population in Alcohol right now is 100,928 100, 100, um, residents. And this is a little map of how the Alcohol City um, sections off their crime statistics. Uh, the Alcohol Police Department has uh, different sectors where they divide their law enforcement and send out so that they can be able to manage and keep track of the different crimes that are occurring in Alpha Home. Um, the Bay of Vista apartment complex is located in the number 10, so in that sector. And that sector is one of the most impoverished um, parts of the Alpha Home community. Uh, it is very close to one of the bigger, bigger malls located in Alpha Home. It is also close to the freeways um, and there are a high number of liquor stores and um, smoke shops located in that area as well. Okay. So an opportunity for innovation where creativity meets practice. Um, traditionally, as a CWS employee and part-time Title IV E student, we were required to do our internship at another region, in another office, just doing a different program than what we are currently doing. And, you know, again, that made it an easy, easy opportunity for any worker who is trying to manage both school and work at the same time, but not very challenging. Um, myself and two of my fellow classmates that Ken mentioned earlier, Sarah Glass and Summer Evans, we, as we drew closer to our second year placement where we had to decide where we wanted to do our internship, Ken asked us a very simple question, but it was a question that we found it very difficult to, to comprehend. His basic question was, what do you want to get out of your internship? And we were perplexed. You know, we did not know how to answer what we, how to answer that question, what do we want to get out of it? Because we assumed, well, we really don't have any option other than what you present to us as going to another region. Um, as he asked us that question, it took us a while before we can actually answer. It took us a couple of emails back and forth. But as we discussed with them, us three, we knew that one of the main things we wanted to do is remain in East Region. Uh, this is where us three had started working. We have already worked there for several years. And that in, in working, we had developed partnerships. We had developed a relationship through the community because of Neighborhoods for Kids model. So we started working with Ken and letting him know that we want to stay in our same region, but what can we do? How can we make that happen? How can we make or get approval, not only from the school, but also from CWS, you know, the higher ups, the management. Um, another thing we wanted to do is, we wanted to really challenge ourselves and not just stay within our region and work in a different program, but also do something that's more community-based, really help and be able to provide more preventative, preventative services. And this is where we came to the idea of the Bay of Vista Apartments. Like I said earlier, the Bay of Vista Apartments is lo was located in that sector 10 of the highest crime rates. Um, in 2010, Bay of Vista was named the second largest area that had um, high calls for service by law enforcement. Um, these crimes included calls for domestic violence, calls for neglect, um, 
child endangerment, substance abuse, and loitering. concerns was um, Bay of Vista was an apartment complex that we were very familiar with. Uh, working with child welfare, I had frequented uh, going out to the apartment complex and investigating referrals for child abuse and neglect. In 2010, there were 35 referrals, so that means 35 times that we responded as a child welfare agency to that apartment complex alone, and there were 312 calls um, for service with law enforcement. So we knew that based on the location of this apartment and the need, um, because of the high rates of law enforcement activity and child welfare, we knew that this would be a perfect place for us to be able to go out there and hopefully provide services to strengthen the community, bring the community together, but also be able to prevent and lessen the number of times that law enforcement goes out there as well as child welfare services. Also, um, Bay Vista Apartments was one of the first apartments in Alcamon who was able to get in um, the crime-free housing. But at the same time, in two, early 2010, they lost that privilege because of the high crimes um, that were going on in that apartment complex. And Bay Vista, um, in our time researching and getting to know Bay Vista, we found that 70% of the residents there were Latino and Hispanic um, families. And the remaining 30% consisted of you know, white um, families, African American, uh, Chaldean and Arabic, and most recently Russian. Um, so we knew that this would be a perfect opportunity to us for us to help those who are in need and new to the community as well. Um, as social workers, one of our beliefs is that all families have the inherent strengths to be able to provide a safe and stable environment for their kids. However, it is very common that based on, you know, I um, based on lack of education, based on financial difficulties, sometimes it's difficult for these parents to be able to provide that safe home. Not that they don't want to, but they run into these hardships that end up putting their children at risk. Um, our goal is, our goal for this, working with this apartment complex is to be able to give these parents, give these families back the power that they need so that they would be able to care for their children, provide for their children, and parent their children in a safe environment to promote child safety and well-being. Okay. Um, as we contemplated on how we would work with these families, we really, it was really grassroots. We had no clue on how we would engage um, the, how we would engage, engage the residents. Um, but obviously being MSW students, we knew that we had to have some sort of practice and theory models in place. We um, utilized the systems theory, Rothman's community development model, and the one that was our base for it was a family-centered community building, the FCCB, which is a process of engaging family and residents and other stakeholders in a collaborative effort to strengthen and improve conditions for families within the community to promote child safety. Um, like I said earlier, as child welfare social workers, we had frequented this apartment complex. So one of the challenges for us was how were we going to engage residents in this community who have seen us before as child welfare services worker? How would we gain their trust? How would we help them understand that we're not here in a child welfare services capacity, but more as a helping agent? Um, one of the main things that we decided to do was to go out there. First, to go out through the community, um, the residents of the uh, apartment complex, and speak with the manager. Um, we knew that having the manager's buy-in would be the first and most important thing because they're the ones that are there for most of the time and know what is going on within the complex. Um, luckily for us, the manager had already had concerns regarding the residents and did not know what avenue to take. So when we came on board, she was completely all for it, um, had some ideas of her own, and was very accepting of our presence. We let her know that this was an internship effort, that we were not coming as child welfare workers, but we did have that foundation. Um, and we decided that our the first and foremost thing that we needed to do, like I said, is to go out and introduce ourselves to the residents. What we did is we 
composed a flyer with our names, with San Diego State and Child Welfare, with our names and what our goals were. The goals were to, one, see what they needed, see what, um, what type of services and resources that they could benefit from, and definitely let them know that that's what we were here for. And a part of this funny story is when we were going out posting, you know, the uh, flyers door to door, meeting the residents and posting in the common areas, we had a client who looked at the flyers, saw the names and said, no, you're not interns, you guys are with CPS. And, you know, you guys are lying. And we had to explain that, yes, we are with Child Welfare, but we are in a different capacity. So we knew we were going to have some difficulty with that, and we needed to be patient um, in our approach. After that, um, it was nearing the holiday of Halloween. So we knew that we needed to gain their trust. And part of gaining trust is letting them know that we're here to provide resources, provide information and education. So what we did is we, again, got some flyers together on um, trick-or-treating tips, safety tips for their kids. And we went around posting and handing out these flyers along with glow sticks. The children loved them. Children loved them and the parents were very appreciative that we were here on our own time and giving them things and giving them education as well. Um, and by doing this door to door and posting them in the common areas, they were able to meet with us and we were able to talk to them and briefly explain what our, our goals were. Um, the next thing that we, need, we knew we needed to do is conduct a needs assessment. Um, obviously, because we have been involved with this apartment complex, we as agency workers knew what this community needed, but we wanted to steer away from that and see what they really felt that they needed. So we developed a needs assessment survey that consisted of diff uh, 30 different questions, ranging anywhere from, do you feel safe in your community? Um, what type of things concern you? Are you concerned because of violence in the community? Um, would you, do you have any connections with other uh, residents in the community? Would you be apt to report any um, you know, law-breaking activities, any criminal activities? Should they, you know, should be, you be privy to them? And we went door to door again. And like I said, 70% um, of these families were like, are Latino and Hispanic. And only myself I was the only one that speaks Spanish. Uh, Sarah and Summer um, were able to divide that within themselves. So we went door to door. And just to explain, this is 150 apartments within this apartment complex. So it took some time. It took some time. Um, and one thing we felt um, it was kind of, um, not difficult for us, but challenging for us is how we would approach these residents and asking them to do, you know, complete these surveys. Before, as child welfare services, we would knock on doors and say, I need to talk to you. I need to gain this information. And now we needed to reframe that. So we made it a point that every door that we knocked on, every uh, resident that we came in contact with, is we introduced ourselves and we asked them if they'd be willing to take this survey. Um, more often than not, everyone was willing to fill out these surveys. And some of them even asked them to, you know, they would answer the questions, we'd read them off, they would answer the questions. Um, many of them invited us into their homes, invited us into their homes, offered us some soft drinks, offered us coffee, and we were able to not only facilitate having them fill out this needs assessment, but also get to know them on a more personal level. And they were able to ask us questions as far as what are, why we were there, what our capacity was and what we would be able to offer them. Let's see. Okay. After um, they completed the surveys, surveys, what we found was that four, um, you know, out of the 150, only 48 residents completed the survey. And some of that was due because either they were at work, we were unable to um, connect with them, and some of them really did not want to. Um, Many of the residents there are undocumented, are undocumented residents, and they had that underlying fear that if they put their name on something, if they fill something out, that can run the risk of affecting um, their stay here. The identified things that were found is that most of the residents did not feel safe in the complex. Um, many of them said that they keep to themselves, and if they see some type of crime going on, like theft, drug use, uh, domestic violence, they choose to not get involved for fear of retaliation. Um, some of the other concerns were the lack of juvenile supervision. One of the main things that even the manager brought up is that uh, several, several young boys ranging age from 12 to 
18 were loitering, would be out in the complex, would be using drugs, engaging in fights, and engaging in, um, you know, de defacing the, the complex. And we knew that we needed to get other community, uh, community partners involved with us. So we started taking a look at what surrounded the apartment complex. In Al Cajon, we have several, several um, community organizations that we were able to connect with. Some of them, for example, are the Boys and Girls Club, the Al Cajon Police Department, uh, the Family Justice Center, uh, also the Resource Center, which is actually located at the Al Cajon High School right across from the apartment complex. Um, by engaging these, these partners, by engaging these community partners, we're able to, one, collaboratively work together and be able to provide services for um, these residents. We also knew that we needed to um, come up with a more strategic plan. And this was actually developed within the second year of this internship project. Um, initially, the first year that we were on, we, it was information gathering. Um, again, initial planning on how we would approach this uh, particular internship. And again, planning for future events and developing a plan on how we would be able to carry this out. Okay. Community engagement and events and activities. Like I said, the main goal for us during the first year was to be able to gain the trust from the residents. And how would we do that? Um, we thought, you know, I thought to myself, anytime I go to something and they give free things, I love it. I definitely will sign up. Sometimes I sign up for a credit card just to get the free t-shirts. I donated blood just to get the free t-shirts. Um, and we know that that's sometimes a very common theme within um, uh, communities, especially the, the residents in this community who are uh, low, of lower social economic uh, status. So we began by, but we began by providing resource fairs. Um, again, formal and informal resources. We would lay out tables within the community. Um, this may, may, the main thing uh, in these events was held um, near the office where the manager was located and we would put out just simple tables with several resources. Uh, post some balloons and be there and available for any residents who would be able to come and again ask questions. And one thing that we noticed is that we had an influx of several residents coming and saying, what do you have, what type of resources? And we actually found that residents have actually tried to call several of these different resources that are available, but at some point or another, their calls were not answered or they had a busy call or nobody returned the call, so they would give up. And the good thing about this is that we were there available and were able to try these numbers again and encourage them not to give up. Um, the main thing is that we obviously our, our goal was to teach residents to be self-sufficient, self-sufficient and be able to seek resources on their own as we move forward. Um, some of the other events that we did is definitely promoting healthy living and reading literacy. And this was in part um, with a focus of children. We collaborated with uh, WIC, uh, Women, and Infant, Women, Infant, and Children, um, and were able to get a, a representative from the WIC department to, be, to come out and demonstrate uh, healthy eating. And that's the picture on the left. Um, it was amazing that when these kids came out, they were so attentive, um, and it was actually interactive where they were able to uh, put some, some items together to be able to create a dip, um, cut some fruit up, and be able to enjoy it and be able to um, educate them on how to eat healthier and stay healthy. Um, one of the things that was very surprising is that almost all of these children had never tried edamame, and that's one thing that they were passing around. And you know, we think, who hasn't had it a moment, right? Um, but these kids, it was something new. And again, it goes back to because they are from a lower social economic status and they don't have that opportunity to be able to gain fresh fruits and different, um, different type of fruits and vegetables. Uh, another thing that we definitely promoted was literacy. We had an event where we took several books out there and we read to the children and we also asked, had the older children read to other kids in the community. And even parents, when they came to that event, children were able to reach to their parents. Uh, we found that more a, a few of the parents were um, illiterate, so it was nice to see that the children were able and willing to reach to their children, and you know the parents were receptive. Uh, we also were able to hand out um, different toys that uh, fostered uh, development, and also these kits that we gained from um, the building um, 
where we get from all first five. These um, first five kits that we uh, were able to receive as a donation to first time parents. These kits included a DVD on you know basic parenting skills, development, um, books, and different resources that are available for them in San Diego County as well. And um, a good story is these items that we were giving away, we had um, a time where we were giving out these items and these two women who were Russian speaking, so none of us had, you know, spoke Russian, and they came and they participated in the activity. They tried to fill out the, the form as best as they could, and when they did it and we handed out these items such as the um, development games and the, the numbers board, they were so happy and so appreciative that they gave us a hug. And it was amazing to see that even though we did not communicate with our words, we were able to communicate with kindness, which is universal, you know, with a smile, with be, being able to give them and help them and just exchange a smile and know that we're here to help them. So it was really nice to see that. Um, our initial outcomes. Like I mentioned earlier, originally in 2010, early 2010, this apartment complex had lost its had lost its um, crime-free house, crime-free multi-housing. At the end of the 2010-2011 academic year, we were able to help them and support them and get them right back on where they still are today. Also, um, this last year, uh, we were able to facilitate and help promote and get the management and owner to get on board and build a new playground. So the one on the left, where the kids are actually on, is usually roped off with yellow tape so that they don't want it because it was very dangerous. And obviously the one on the right is completely new. And we were able to not only engage the apartment manager and owners, but also the residents to take pride in where they live so that they would be able to take care of the new playground. Um, some of the progress really quick is 2010-2011. That's a little outline of these referrals that we went out on. Like I said, there was 35 referrals that um, were assigned to that complex in itself. And so far, the update is that there has been a 34% decrease in CWS involvement, including referrals and open cases. And there has been a 31% decrease in calls for service you know, regarding crime at the complex. Um, some of the other um, progress that we made is we actually have an internship unit in East County, which began in fall 2012 and spring 2013. So now it's comprised of three field instructors, 10 task supervisors, and it also includes six San Diego State University students and two University of Southern California students. Implementation and implementation of sustainability. Again, we are able, because what we started back in 2010, and the progress that we have made, even though it may not be as much as we, we think or had wanted, but we have been able to engage other apartment complexes in East Region and we're able to replicate what we have um, started in Bella Vista. Again, um, one of the main goals that we wanted to do is continue our efforts, not only through the academic year, but also during the summer and winter months. And some of that is um, just recently we had an educational training at the complex regarding swimming pool safety. Um, challenges, lessons learned, and future planning. Again, the turnover rate of residents at the complex. This is a month-to-month -month lease, so that makes it a little di bit difficult for us to be able to reassess and see um, what they feel that has improved. Another um, one of the challenges is that the apartment complex was recently sold and there is new management. Um, and new ownership, but the information we have is that they're willing to work with us and still allow us to be part of the complex. Um, again, just logistics on how to be able to evaluate the um, changes and improvements. And one of the underlying um, issues was no funding, but because we are able to utilize interns from both San Diego State and the University of California, it's really virtually no cost to the county. Um, and again, it benefits students, and again, the county on being able to engage with a community um, project. Um, again, other some of the challenges, just case assignments within the um, within the complex and the agency. The um, other, just the co-location of internship and employment, making sure that we're meeting all the goals, and you know, just changing the view of CWS representation within the community and confidentiality as a whole. Um, lessons learned. We were able to create a referral procedure for um, you know interns and incoming interns. We have also, um, because of the work we did as interns, 
our regular line staff has um, volunteered and continues to volunteer when we have activities for the kids and the families uh, at the complex. Um, we continue to negotiate with community partners and get their buy-in to be able to assist and support our project. And again, um, you know, if clients do become involved with the juvenile system, we are working on how we can assign them um, in, in correlation with the interns who are working in the complex. Um, again, another thing is just implementing year-round program, like I said, is you know, continuing this effort during the summer months and winter breaks. Um, key factors, support from leadership, that's what really helped us. Um, development, uh, the, the development of activities to shift CWS staff and thinking about prevention and early intervention. Obviously, um, social work, CWS is more of a reactive type of agency, so we definitely want to make sure we're, and we're hopeful that through this project we can kind of shift that way of thinking. Um, again, funding for prevention and early intervention, and having a more clear understanding of the roles and expectation, expectations among the collaboration, and then our planning strategy. I know I'm rushing through this, and um, ways to improve, Again, the implementation of the strategic plan, uh, implementation of the community project with other complexes, partner reading up with the community organizations, um, hopefully be able to write and apply for a grant, and develop a parent partner program with Homestar Inc. to have parent partners go into the community and assist parents who are there. And above all, evaluation, evaluation, evaluation. You know, that's what shows us how things are working, how we can improve it, and hopefully how we can replicate it in the future. Um, and there is our contact information. Okay.